The conversation about calling is one of the most misunderstood conversations, I think, in the faith. And, and that's a little bit scary because that's the one thing about the faith you don't want to get wrong. Like what you're supposed to be doing with your life isn't the thing you want to get wrong. This is Dr. Darius Daniels. He went from changing his mind about becoming a lawyer in the middle of college to decide to become a pastor instead. Well, he has turned that calling and decision into becoming one of the most transformational and prolific speakers and entrepreneurs of our generation. I got to go to Atlanta to sit down and speak with Dr. Daniels in front of a live audience. And he shared with me what most people are actually getting wrong about their calling. How do you know if it's really your calling? I kind of reject the question a little bit. Yeah. I do. He also shared the difference between clarity and certainty, some of the assumptions that we make when it comes to our calling and its relationship with money, and how to steward your gifts properly for the season of life you are currently in. I'm Cleve the Visionary, and this is the Build Your Vision podcast, the only show completely dedicated to helping you build clarity for your future, your finances, and your faith, because we believe the quality of your life is directly determined by the clarity of your vision. Let's go. So can you give a big hand, some big energy for Dr. Darius Daniels. Long time coming. Long, long time coming, man. Long we time. can make it happen, man. Proud of you. You're doing incredible things. I'm just grateful to see all the fruit that I'm seeing in terms of everything that's happening with you. You just get started. Thank y'all you. proud of Cleveland? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to say first what I know about you. And luckily, I've been able to get behind stage or backstage, to, and I know a little bit more about you maybe than the average person or the person mm-hmm. that watches you on YouTube. But I still don't know that, that much, right? And um, I'll say, I do know this. I do know you were born in 19, <clears throat> whatever, year, right? Uh, in Kill Michael, Mississippi. You were born to a pastor, bivocational pastor, minister. You also went to undergrad in Mississippi, in Jackson. You went to Millsaps College. You are starting guard on the majors, men's basketball team. Uh, you decided just not to go to the 2001 NBA, NBA draft. That just wasn't yeah, your you route, know. right? Yeah. Okay. They were sweating me. They was, yeah. Like, Stop sweating me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you married Pastor Shamika at 23 years old, I believe, 22? 22. 22? 22. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, you went on to Princeton to Seminary. I don't know. Who went on. But go ahead. Let me not throw out numbers for the rest yes. of this interview. Um, you went to Princeton Seminary. At that time, I think you maybe were pastoring a church in Trenton, New Jersey? I was, I was interning there Interning first, there? Okay. And then I was the interim. Right. I went from interim to interim, yep. Got you. Okay. From there... 2005, 2006, you started change? 2005, yeah. 2005, okay. And then, you know, you've grown into the person, done the books, you've done Darius Daniel Enterprises, you've done, of course, I3, all this stuff, right? Okay, we're kind of caught up. You have two amazing young men as sons. Here's the thing for me when I listen to podcasts and we hear these stories, right? I understand the chronological stuff, but for me, I need, I understand the chronological sequence of events. For me to better understand how I can apply things to my life, I need more of the mental sequence of events. So I kind of want to get into, as you went through this journey, what was going on up here for Somebody you? Somebody grab me a water, please. I, that's why I, I felt bad, because I had this water that I brought from up here, and I feel like I already drank out of it, though, so I didn't want to. <laughs> you know, we got the vid going. <laughs> We close, but. (laughs) Um, So the first thing I want to ask you is, did you know you were called to this? And if so, when did you know? Oh, when you say, did I know I was called to this, you mean what I'm currently doing now? Yes. No. 
I knew I was called to something. I knew that something was using my words to help people. And in terms of the way that kind of manifested itself, it manifested itself on a season by season basis. So I operated with the clarity I had for the season I was in. Mm -hmm. Rarely did I have clarity for the next season. And um, so I didn't see my life or my contribution to other people unfolding the way it's unfolded. Um, I saw the step I was supposed to take next. I took that step, tried to steward it well, and remained open to what step I felt like was gonna be the next step, next phase, next chapter in my journey. Okay, great. This is great. So you decided, I, I, I kind of jumped over this, you originally went to undergrad for become a lawyer. Yes. Major in political science. You, you had to change a heart or a divine intervention or whatever. Yeah. And decided to go into ministry. When you made that shift, how did you identify it? Like, did you, did you say, this is what God is calling me to do? Or is, was it more so, I don't think my gifts are going to be properly managed in this space. So I'm going to put oh, in no, this no, space. No, like, no, how? no, no. It was not that. I don't feel that way to this day. I oh. still feel like I would have killed law. Mm. <laughs> to this day. I've, because part of what you see in me in terms of work ethic that manifests itself not just in how hard I work on my job, but how hard I work on me is something that was divinely instilled in me through the vehicle of my father. So no matter what Darius would have done, Darius would have went hard in the paint for that thing. Because that's a core value of me as a person that is not necessarily attached to a particular role. So the pivot to away from law school was a pivot that was a result of a clear sense that God wanted me to use my life in ministry, serving other people in a way where law school didn't fit into the equation. Because when I first started getting a sense of what I was supposed to do, I had to, and I don't know, I, I don't know if I've talked a lot about this, in the, part of the reason it took me so long to say yes was I had to get over my assumptions of what saying yes meant. I thought saying yes to this ministry thing meant saying yes to poverty. And what is often underestimated is not the economic ramifications of poverty, but the emotional ramifications of poverty. When you experience poverty, there is a degree of emotional trauma mm -hmm. that you experience that can produce a fear of ever having to go back to that. Right. And so I think it kind of took me longer to say yes to this ministry thing because I had to overcome. And I don't think I overcame it because I don't know how to overcome certain fears. I just know how to replace an inferior fear with a superior fear. So I was still scared to do it. I was just more scared not to obey God. Yeah. So I just did it anyway. Yeah. What did, it, what did that feel like? Like you knowing this is the route, now I just have to obey. Yeah, it, I mean, there was a degree of anxiety attached to it, but it wasn't a whole lot because I'm 20, 21. And in my mind, I always think, I'm always thinking backup plans. So I'm like, God, I'm going to do this thing. If it don't work, I'm going to spend the block and go back to law school. Okay. Or if it doesn't work, I'm going to go into the academy. I'll get my PhD and I'll go into the academy. So I was open to stuff like that all the way even in seminary. So when I was in Princeton, I got invited to this event by one of the professors there where they kind of identified students who had potential PhD potential. Mm -hmm. I got invited to that. I got extended the opportunity to try to go on this track to go on a PhD work so I could be a professor, all those kinds of things. So um, 
yeah, long story short, man, it was just um, some anxiety, but, but, but not a lot. Uh, I, I just felt like, hey, I'm going to take this one season at a time. How do you know if it's really your calling? Because I feel like a lot of young people are wading in that, the water of decision. They are. Because they're not certain yeah. or clear. Mm -hmm. I kind of reject the question a little bit. Yeah? I do. I reject the premise of the question. That's what I was thinking. Cause, okay. The premise okay. of the question yeah. is based on an assumption that clarity is not relative. Mm -hmm. It's based on the assumption that there's a degree of certainty I have to have. Exactly, right. To do a thing God's called me to do. Yeah. When clarity can be 51%. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, how do you know it's really God? I think there are seasons where it, from time to time you probably question. Yeah. It's like, I think I told you, I think you told me to jump out of this boat. I was, I was at 90% when I stepped out. Now that I'm out here and the wind is blowing and it's getting a little shaky, I'm down to like 53%. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Now I'm drowning. I'm like, okay, it's 45%. Then Jesus picked me back up and take me back to the boat. Okay, I'm 80% now. So uh, I think I had a degree of clarity when I made the decision. That was the degree of clarity I needed for my decision. I don't assume that everyone has to have the degree of clarity that I had because everybody's next step isn't as drastic as mine was. Mm -hmm. So for a, leap that was, for, for a leap that was that drastic, it required a degree of clarity for me that I didn't have, let's say, when I planted the church. So going to seminary, like 95% clarity. Planting the church, like 55%. Wow. But they were both God. Yeah. I came into understanding Change Church. You were still in Jersey at the time, but it was, you know, you were multi-location. In the beginning stages, you're building the vision. What was that experience like mentally for you as you're trying to make this thing literally out of nothing? You're, you're planting a church and it needs to grow. What was that er those, those early days like for you? I think we all know everything is built twice. It's built in your mind first, then you build it in reality. And so for me, I think I'm still building what I saw when I first started. So what I saw with the eyes in my heart in 2005, I don't see yet with the eyes in my head in 2023. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Did y'all catch that? Because if your vision is only success, that's your vision. Say that one more time. Well, hold on. <laughs> If your vision is only success, success by cultural standards, then that's your vision. It's not God's. Because success for God is when the vision in your heart actually becomes, when you faithfully steward the vision that he gives you in your heart in a way, that it actually becomes a manifested reality in your life. So success for him is faithfulness. Yeah. And in culture, we call the fruit of some of our, or the statements of some of our success, success. Um, so like a, a large following isn't spiritual success. Right, yeah. Does that make sense? That makes sense. A big, yeah. church is, a big church is like church success is what culture would call successful. The, what I'm gonna be held accountable for is Darius how did you steward the vision I gave you in your heart? And did you settle for a definition of success that culture gave you and not a definition of success that I gave you? So I am not gauging success on how well I feel like I'm doing based on the average pastor because that's not what I'm being held accountable for. Mm. I'm being held accountable to not how I'm doing in comparison to the other person, but how I'm doing in comparison to my own potential. I would say even vice versa, because I'm looking at you and I'm comparing what I'm going through. I'm like, maybe I'm not doing it right. When it's like, 
no, you're doing it right, but you're at the level that you're at in the season that you're in. So I think it could go both ways, um, you know, especially with social media and all that yeah, stuff. Sure. Where we're seeing everybody else. So um, <clears throat> you said something in yes yesterday. You said some people are in love with the idea of what they think they're supposed to be doing instead of doing what they're supposed to be doing in that season. Yeah. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit more for me? Yes, yeah, the difference between calling and role, basically, that people can confuse. So there are three terms, y'all, some people heard me talk about these before, right? That I think is, I think this is one of the most, the conversation about calling is one of the most misunderstood conversations, I think, in the faith. And, and that's a little bit scary because that's the one thing about the faith you don't want to get wrong. Yeah. Like what you're supposed to be doing with your life, even the thing you want to get wrong. If you don't quite understand eschatology and when Jesus is coming back, eh, that's all right. If you don't know what you're supposed to do with your life, that's a little bit different. So I say purpose. Purpose is the reason for the creation or the existence of a thing, right? It's not determined, you discover it. Calling is God's invitation for your participation in the reason for that creation. Role is a set of responsibilities he calls you to in certain seasons. So you accomplish your purpose when you say yes to his calling to different roles over the course of your lifetime. So people, y'all hear what I just said? Yeah, so you, you, you accomplish purpose when you say yes to his calling to different roles over the course of your lifetime. So you can't say you are faithful because you've been faithful. You're only as faithful as your last yes. Yeah. So if I stop saying yes at New Jersey, I can't say I was being faithful. So saying yes to abandon law school and go to seminary, that was one calling, that was God's invitation to a set of responsibilities in that season. So seminary was a season of preparation because your first call is a call of preparation. Then I had to, I had to say yes to different invitations he was extending to me to do different things at different seasons. I had to say yes to the calling to the marketplace. So the point that I'm making is, I just kind of feel like a lot of times people fall in love with a role because you think it's a calling. And they're not the same thing you're called to a role. Does that make sense? Yeah. But when that role, when that particular, there are times where God calls you to like leave that role, and then there are times that God calls you not to leave it, but to redefine it. Mm -hmm. And then there are times that God calls you to expand it. So I just kind of feel like uh, when I say people fall in love with what they think they're supposed to be doing, it's they fall in love with a role or with an expression as opposed to I'm in love with my purpose. And that means that I'm going to keep saying yes to different invitations he extends to me to assume certain sets of responsibility. So even in our inner circle, to be honest, that's the burden I want people to feel a little bit. Because if you don't feel that burden, you're always going to treat your programs as optional. You're never going to start because you think it's your choice. Because if, wow. if it's your choice, you start when you're comfortable. If it's your choice, you wait until you get over your shyness to do things. But when you feel a, a divine responsibility to do it, when you say, this is God saying, now I want to use these gifts in this way, there's a different weight that is associated with that. And um, if you assume that the way he has used your gifts is the only way he wants to use your gifts, then um, you, you step out, you step into a season where you can say you've been faithful, but you can't say you are faithful because you're only as faithful as your last yes. Let that marinate a little bit for you. Whew, that was, I want to touch on something Coach Kelly said. Sure. Coach Kelly was talking about, I forgot what the question was that, that initiated her response. But she was talking, it was some, somewhat like the ikigai model where you know you have like this sphere and it has these different segments, things that you're good at, things that you're passionate about, things that people want to demand, right? Um, calling and role. What if you feel like you're being called to a role that you don't feel like you were called to, but all the other things are there? So like the demand is there, the aptitude is there. Yeah, yeah, I there. got you, I got you, yeah. 
How well, do you do that? I, I think the answer to that question is also in something that she said, and that is just because you can doesn't mean you should. So all of those things can be there, and you can look at that and say, I could lean into this, and I could potentially see some fruit from it. But the question is not, can I? It's should I, remember? Passion is what you like to do. Talent is what you're capable of doing. Purpose is what you were born to do. And so that should kind of guide those decisions. I did a, a teaching a while ago. I think it was called, I can't remember what I called it. But the premise was experiencing strange things require strong nose. Like you being able to discern what you're not supposed to be doing, even though you've got the gifts and the talents and the expertise to do it. Wow. That's a whole nother podcast episode right there. Um, but I want to wrap up with this. Two things. First thing, when it comes to when you feel overworked, unfocused, or overwhelmed, what do you do practically to get you out of that space? So, good, good question. Um, I'm going to pull out. I'm going to rest. It's literally that simple. Um, if I feel overworked, I'm going to rest. I'm going to call Tracy, and I'm going to say, move this, cancel that, tell him I ain't coming. Now, I'm not saying I'm irresponsible with my commitments, but I've seen a lot in this space. And once you've been exposed, you can't be unexposed. And so what I've seen is this. Everybody wants you to take care of you as long as you take care of you on the next person. Right, exactly, yeah. And particularly in the spiritual leadership space, all bad things that leaders, spiritual leaders do aren't because they're bad people. Mm -hmm. Some of them hit bad places. They don't properly deal with their brokenness. And then their brokenness produces some badness. And I saw and I see how quick the church throw them away. Yeah. 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 They will throw you away. And so what I say sometimes is, if I got to pull out from something, if I got to decommit to something, which I don't plan on being on one, I'm just, but this is the way I framed it. If I was in a scandal, would they counsel me? Mm -hmm. They would. Yeah. Because ultimately, they're responsible for stewarding the integrity of the house God's called them to lead. And some, they probably should yeah. if it's going to bring a reproach or a distraction to what they're doing in that house. Yeah. So they're responsible for stewarding them. I'm responsible for stewarding me. And um, so if, if I feel overworked and things of that, that particular nature, I will, uh, uh, I'm going to pull out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest. I'm going to refuel. I'm going to replenish. And uh, a lot of times that helps me realign. Pulling away and getting that quiet time to just think um, could keep you from making certain mistakes out of haste. Um, yeah. out of fatigue, you know? I think it helped you professionally, like organizationally. But most of the time, something crumbles with spiritual leadership more often than not, not because of competence, it's character. Like, that's the thing that blows stuff up, um, destroys, causes stuff to, to implode. So I think that replenishment is so important, and I think I've shared this uh, I don't know if I shared it in this setting before. I know I've shared it in other settings before. It was like there was a season when I started looking at like these kind of trends of maybe spiritual leaders who went through rough seasons. And then it was after the rough season that they got a counselor. They started taking sabbaticals, started taking about, talking about the importance of rest. I saw that happening. And I went to Pastor Mika one day and I said, it seemed like everybody going to counseling like after they mess it all up. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> Be proactive. When I had my burnout in 2014, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be proactive about this. 
And let me, let me get in front of this, and uh, I don't claim to be this, that, or, or the other, but I do understand the implications of not stewarding yourself well and having replenishment disciplines and resting and how everything I built is built on the back of integrity. It all goes away if I lose that. Yeah. Yeah. Did y'all hear what I... Yeah. I know. Are they supposed to be here or no? Yeah, yeah. They, they can they talk here? about Okay, me. all right. Yeah, I was about to say, did y'all hear what I just said? I was like, oh, what am I supposed to be? <laughs> I don't know if y'all supposed to be here. Yeah, I'm telling everybody that this Everything is that I've built is built on the back yeah. of integrity. So you have to see keeping that intact as I have to see keeping that intact as a part of my job. Yeah. Because it affects every single thing that I'm building. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time I heard someone say, you know, the U.S. is the only country that drinks tea after you get sick. Wow. Everybody else drinks it preventively. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Last question. If you owned a billboard, it was owned by Change Church, Dr. Darius Enterprises, and everyone in the world drove past this board. It was on the highway to heaven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what would you want the message everyone to read to be? It's a great question. Um, this, is, this may sound, I hope it's not, it may sound a bit contradictory to some things I've said in the past. I hope it isn't. What I would say, Cleavon, is the words would be, there's more in you. And I'm a be led guy, not be driven guy. I'm an ebb and flow guy, not a hustle and grind guy. Yet at the same time, I, I mentioned this last week, I heard a Miles Monroe quote that rocked me. And he said, the richest place in the world is a cemetery. And uh, I would want people to know that, that there's more in you. And my hope would be that their discomfort, their fear, their insecurities wouldn't cause them to rob the world of what they have and what so many other people need. Yeah. I think about all the people that have impacted my life and the stuff, and I can't imagine where I would be yeah. if they hadn't been generous with themselves. Yeah. My life is better because of that. Um, Bishop McBath move something very significant around to be here in person today because he's generous with himself. And I think about what kind of leadership issues would I have to navigate on my own or what mistakes would have been made if he didn't believe after he's getting ready to retire, he's retiring in July, if he didn't believe, there's more. There's another lane. I didn't need McBath to pastor. Right. I needed McBath the leadership coach. Yeah. And because he made a pivot, he addressed a, a deficit that I had in a certain season. And the timing of his pivot perfectly matched the timing of my deficit. Mm. And so even the timing upon which God calls you to pivot is aligned with the deficits yeah. that other people have. Yeah. PD, you are, you're doing that for all of us right here. And we're going to do the same thing for everybody that comes in contact with us. Thank you. Let's go. Was that good, y'all?